So, hi and welcome everybody to the lecture in signal energy and signal spectral density and power spectral density in, com in communication systems. So, basically in this lecture, we will discuss the following topics, signal energy, energy spectral density, power spectral density, and how is it related to autocorrelation. Then we will give you a brief introduction about analog communication system, analog modulation system, basic one, which is using amplitude modulation. And then you give you some examples. So we learned in the previous lecture how to calculate the power of a signal. We also learned how to calculate the energy of a signal. How do you calculate the energy of a signal? Basically, the energy is equal to the integration of the function amplitude square. The amplitude square of the function. And this, based on Barcival theorem, is found to be exactly equal to the integration of the amplitude square of the frequency response of the function. So basically, if I tell you find the energy and I give you the spectrum of the signal, you can find it from there. Or if you don't have the spectrum, you have only the signal in time domain, you can also find it easily. Why do we, why this is important and why, where can we use this? Basically, there are times where g of t in time domain is so complex that you cannot find the integration of it, especially after you square it. But when you go to the frequency domain, you find it is so simple. It's just pulses in the frequency domain. So what do you do? The integration in the frequency domain becomes kind of summation of coefficients. So quickly you can find the energy. Signal has same total energy, e.g., in the time domain and the frequency domain. This is what Parseval theorem says. We have also what we call essential bandwidth, which is the range of frequencies with most of the signal's energy in it. The definition of most depends on the application, so we can define most 90%. So we say the efficient bandwidth corresponds to 90% of the energy of the signal. How do you now now, that this is efficient bandwidth. How do you define it? What's the corresponding energy to it? We call it instead of EG, we call it EB. Now the integration not from minus infinity to infinity, the integration now from minus B to B of the function, the frequency domain, and B is such that EB is equal 90%. So what's B? The question can be, what's B? that gives you 90% of the energy. Not the whole energy of the signal, 90%. So basically, you tell me, uh, EG is usually should be complete unity. EB over EG with, ha, has this percent. If I am saying 90%, so it's 0 0.9. And you can find B. Well, now this is by words and by math. Graphically, how do we explain this? You have the pulse, this is your signal, your pulse, yes? And I tell you, find the energy of this pulse. What do you do? You integrate from minus infinity to infinity, GF, absolute, absolute square. Now, if I tell you, I want 90% of the energy. So you tell me I should integrate it from certain bandwidth to certain bandwidth, which means certain frequency here to certain frequency, so that the energy, the area under this integration is 90% of the original one. By doing so, you just have B unknown. Yes, you only have B unknown, therefore you just integrate and substitute the value of B equated with 0.9 and you find what's B that gives you 90% of the energy. It, is it always 90%? No, it can be 95, 99, it can be half amplitude width, half power width. For example, half power width. What do I mean by half power width? This is the power, the, this is the maximum power at this point. Half power, it's, it's the point at which you have half of the power of your signal. 
So basically, it's here. This this becomes in the middle between the bottom and the top, which is kind of in this location. And at this point, you call the bandwidth here, or B, new B, the bandwidth at which you have half power width. It can, the energy can be 50 percent. So no matter what number I use, it's the same procedure, doesn't change. I just put the values and find what, what's the value of P that gives you this amount of energy. Now, we, found, we, we are able to find the energy of the signal and the effective, the essential bandwidth or effective bandwidth of a signal. Why do we need essential bandwidth? We didn't ask this question. Why do we need essential bandwidth? Because basically, suppose you are taking sync, sync, sync signal. What's the bandwidth of sync? Goes from minus infinity to infinity. Can you wait for your signal from minus infinity to infinity? You cannot. And also, we know ahead of the time that the power at side loops, they are so little, you can ignore them. So you don't need to keep taking your signal from minus infinity to infinity. You take the part of the signal where most of the energy is concentrated on. Most of the energy is there. You take that part and you take, you say, the bandwidth of my signal is this. And the others, I filter them or I don't take them. I don't count for them. Clear? Not difficult. Now, Autocorrelation and energy spectral density, there is a relationship between them. You remember in the previous lecture, we, we talked about convolution, how to find the convolution and the relationship between convolution and frequency transfer function. And we said also autocorrelation is very similar to convolution, but the only difference is, the only difference you, can, you, you see when you take convolution What's the difference? Do you know what's the difference between convolution and autocorrelation? Can you explain to me what's the difference from signal and system knowledge? So what's the difference between them? Any, any answer? Anyone remembers? What's the difference between convolution and autocorrelation? The difference between convolution and autocorrelation is the fact that in convolution, you take the first signal and then you flip the other signal, make it a reflect around y-axis and you start shifting and multiplying and summing. Yes, so that you get your final signal. This is by words. Graphically, let me explain to you graphically what, what's the difference. So suppose you have two signals. The first one, this is the first signal, rect, and this is the second signal. So in convolution, what do you do? You keep the first signal the same, yes? You take the second signal and shift it, reflect it on y-axis because you take, if this is x of t, you take x of minus t, yes? The, when you reflect it, it becomes the same, remains the same, yes, because it's symmetric. But now it remains the same. What do you do after that? You, you make shifts. You keep shifting, shifting, shifting until this enters to this, yes? When it, when it enters the rect function, here there is, there is overlap between the two pulses. When you multiply them with each other, the result will not be zero. So you multiply them with each other, this with this, and you get value here. Multiply and sum all the points, you get your result, whatever it is, the convolution. This is convolution. In autocorrelation, it's the same thing, but we don't, we don't flip. We don't take x of minus t. We just keep it like this. We just cancel these things and keep it like this. Just we move this towards this without reflection. 
So it's basically, as you can see from the math, it's the integration from minus infinity to infinity, g of tau, g conjugate t plus tau. Do you see any minus here? No minus, no reflection. So basically, again, by our fingers, we can say convolution. Suppose this is your signal, and this is another signal. In convolution, what do you do? What do you do in convolution? You, you, you switch this. You reflect this, yes? If it is this, this. And then you start shifting, shifting, shifting. When it touches, you multiply and sum. Multiply and sum and record the result. Multiply and sum and record the result. Until you get your signal. In, this is convolution. You need to flip. What about autocorrelation? You don't flip. You just fix one and shift this, shift this, shift this. So once it enters, once they enter to each other, you start multiplying and summing. Yes, because it's integration of multiplying to... Integration is summation. And two functions multiplied with each other based on the math. You multiply and sum, multiply and sum. And the result is the output of the autocorrelation operation. Basically, now you understand it. You know, if I ask you in the future, what's the difference, how to do them? You understand it by words, by math, the equation, and by visualization. I think the easiest thing is visualization. Yes? The, 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 the easiest thing that makes you understand what's convolution and autocorrelation and the relationship between them is visualization. So, is that clear? So, if you take, now assume you are able to take the autocorrelation function. I gave you function and you found the autocorrelation function. I tell you, find the Fourier transform of this autocorrelation function. The, you will find out that the Fourier transform of the autocorrelation function is the energy spectral density. This GF, it's GF, amplitude square which we define it as a new function given here and we call this energy spectral density it reflects where the energy of the signal is located this is the meaning of this function so basically your signal energy is this yes if I tell you find the energy if I give you the energy spectral density you don't have to put square because it's already squared. You just put the function here. This is energy spectral density. So density, your density with the area gives you the energy. Yes? For example, let, let, let's say I tell you the energy, the energy spectral <coughs> density of a, of a certain function is five five i tell you this the energy spectral density of a certain function is five over the period over the over the frequencies from two to three this is the question find the energy of this signal what i gave you i gave you the energy spectral density which is this omega Frequency. What's the value here? Five. And I tell you, it's from two to three. Five. So, yeah, two to three. Five multiplied by three minus two, one. So it's five. You understand how to find it? What's the This five is energy. Let, let, let's put this four. What will happen here? Multiplied by two. So it becomes ten. Yes? Ten. This is energy different than the energy spectral density. The energy is equal to the energy spectral density if the frequencies are just one, not band of frequencies, because you, you won't have area now to integrate over it. Or if the difference more than, if the difference is not one, exactly one, then they are not equal. Now, let's take a, another example. You have g of t, a signal g of t, and this is rig 2t. Yes? 
Rick Tutti, as you can see here. I tell you in the exam, find the autocorrelation function. What do you do? You, you, you bring another G of T here and you shift them towards each other and multiply and sum, multiply and sum. You will get a result. What's the result? The result is this. This is the autocorrelation function. Now, I tell you, you found the autocorrelation function, find the energy spectral density. What do you do? You take the Fourier transform of this function. Yes? You take the Fourier transform of this function, as I told you here, Fourier transform of the autocorrelation function. Yes? You get this function. This is by math, and this is by drawing. First question. Find out the correlation function. Then you find it here. Then I tell you, find the energy spectral density. You find this function. By math and by drawing, I can ask, or any one of them. Basically, if you understand this concept and understand how to integrate and calculus 1, calculus 2, you can get the answer and be able to draw the function. Well, here, as you can see, the, the energy spectral density is sink square. So basically, there is no, no negative values. So spectral density has no negative values in general. If you... Get both, if you get negative, this means that your solution is wrong. Now this is energy spectral density. What about if, what about if we want to find the power spectral density? To produce the power spectral density or PSD, PSD the autocorrelation for a power signal is defined as basically it's the same as the previous one, but we divide over t and take the limit as t goes to infinity. This is the only difference. And then, to find the power spectral density, you take the Fourier transform. Yes, when you take the Fourier transform, you found what's, what, what we call power spectral density. So, basically, there is no new information here. It's just like energy spectral density, but the way we are doing it, we just divide by T and take the limit. This shows the frequency distribution of the power. Another question that you might get, for example, in the, in the exam. Let's say I tell you the, the, the power spectral density of a, of a certain signal is like this. And this is minus 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 F square. Yes. Why minus F is square, not X? Because the X axis is equal to F here, frequency. Keep it minus here, minus f square. If it was plus f square, it will be like this. Minus will be like this. Now, minus f square, this is the energy spectral density, I tell you. And define the values here, the frequency here, 1, the frequency here, 3. And tell, tell you, the, I don't just gave you the figure and told you this is it. This is the energy spectral density, and this is the frequency band. What's the power of this signal? What do you do? What's the power of this signal? You just integrate. Integration from 1 to 3 minus F square delta F. Yes, this is the function. Can you integrate this? You can. This integration, once you integrate and substitute the value, this is the power. 
So basically, the power is equal to the area area under the power spectral density. The energy is equal to the area under energy spectral density function. Energy spectral density gives you the density of a signal on certain frequencies. And from that density, you can define what's the power, what's the energy within the certain, within certain band. Let G of T be a random binary sequence of rectangular pulses. In practical life, in practical communication systems, we don't have only one pulse, but we have series of pulses because you have too many data, too many data symbols, and you want to transmit them over the channel. So they are coming sequentially, one after another. So this, this is the function, which is summation A and G1, T minus N. And you, you need to find the autocorrelation. The autocorrelation for a small displacement looks like this. So basically, it's the same function. This is the function. You bring another function and you start making small shifts, little by little, until you take all the values and you record what's the output. Yes? So this, this is... This is the minimum shift, this is the largest shift, or another shift, and the output after you, you shift over the whole period, the output of the autocorrelation function is this, this value. This function. This is the autocorrelation function of the previous function. Tells you find the power spectral density, it's the Fourier transform of this. The Fourier transform, you can find it from the, the equation of Fourier transform, which is the function, you put the function, whatever the function here, g of t, multiplied by e to minus j, 2 pi f t, delta t, and that's it, you get it. Now, this is, now you know how to find the energy of a signal, you know how to find the power of a signal, now you are expert in power spectral density, energy spectral density, and I assume if you face any question in the exam related to finding the power, if you are given the power spectral density, you can find it, and vice versa, I give you the power, the band, and tell you find the power spectral density, you should be able to find it. So the question can be forward or backward. You, since you know how to deal with these things, now you can easily do whatever you want with it. So now baseband communication, returning back to baseband communication. The baseband, the definition of baseband is the frequency band of the original signal before modulation. So I'm talking about the signal itself, the message or the data signal before you modulate it. What's, it, it has certain band, certain frequencies, certain bandwidth. So for example, in telephone, telephone lines, what's the base band, the bandwidth of the voice in telephone lines from 300 hertz to, three, four, to, three, to 3,700 hertz. So what's the bandwidth here? Yes, what's the bandwidth here? Around. How do you find the bandwidth? This number minus this number. Because your signal is limited within this range. How do you find the bandwidth between these ranges? You just subtract them. So the bandwidth of your voice is 3400 hertz or 3.4 kilohertz. Now this is for voice, speech. What about audio? Audio, the base band of audio from zero to 200 kilohertz. This is the audio you listen from your phone or from wherever you want. Your ear can listen up to 20 kilohertz. If you generate a frequency higher than 20 kilohertz, do you hear it? No. Your ear can hear only this, 20 kilohertz. 
Television is for seeing the, the frequency, the baseband bandwidth is from 0 to 4.3 megahertz and ethernet which is the internet the data from 0 to 20 megahertz so how do you define baseband then baseband communication usually requires wire like a twisted pair coaxial pair ethernet and so on Multiple baseband signals cannot share a channel without time division multiplexing. For example, assume you have user 1, user 2, user 3, and they want to transmit their signals over the channel. Without using time division multiplexing, they cannot do this. Each one has to use the channel dedicated to himself. But when you have time division multiplexing, what do you do? This user has this signal, let's say, and this has this signal, let's say, and this user has this signal, let's say. So with time division multiplexing the, at the transmitter, you take one sample from here and, and put it on the channel. One sample from here and put it in the channel. One sample from here and put it in the channel. And then it transmit. Since the switch is so fast, the users here don't recognize that they are being uh, postponed. The communication is going normally to them. And at the receiver, there is another multiplexer that takes these samples from the channel and assign them to the receivers. So basically, this is how you can, this is how you can do multiplexing. And it's very important to multiplex multiple users and to send your data over the channel. Now, the, the thing we talked about is baseband. What about the signal after you modulate it? What do you call it? Instead of baseband with B, you call it passband with P. What's the difference here? After modulation, you multiply your baseband signal with a carrier. So the carrier shift your, shifts your signal to a very high frequency. So if your signal is shifted to a high frequency, we call it passband, P, not baseband. And then we are talking about modulation. And to do that, we need to have a carrier. A carrier, which is the frequency, the high frequency signal that carries your data. Carrier communication uses modulation to shift spectrum of a signal to certain band. Wireless communication requires frequencies higher than baseband. And we explained in the first lecture why we need frequencies higher than the baseband. Why? so that you don't interfere with others because if you are in the lower bands whenever you transmit your signal your signal is heard by everybody so security and annoy uh, annoyance you annoy other but when you shift it to a high frequency nobody will listen to you hear your message and also you just get your intended message in a, on a certain frequency Multiple signals can be sent at the same time using different frequencies. We call it frequency division multiplexing. This is the beauty of modulation. Because if, without modulation, if you want to transmit multiple signals to multiple users, the signals will overlap with each other and interfere with each other. But with modulation, you can assign each signal to a certain frequency. F1, 4. So, the, the, third, the first user, the first user here, user 1, he has signal. Yes, this is the signal of user 1. And this is the signal of user 2. And this is the signal of user 3. And this is the signal of user 4. So on. Without modulation, you send them over the channel, they come on top of each other. Nobody can receive them. Yes, they are on top of each other, overlapping. You cannot receive them. But with modulation, with modulation, what do you have? With modulation, you multiply this with F1. 
So at the at, in the frequency spectrum becomes here f1 at f1. You multiply this with f2, so it becomes here f2. This you multiply it by f3, so it becomes adjacent to this. Yes, here it comes here. So as you can see. Do you see any interference between them? Each signal is getting its own band. Yes? Do you see any interference? So each user gets his own signal without any interference. How can you do that? By the magic of modulation. You assign each user signal to a certain frequency and you send them. This concept we call it FDM. Frequency Division Multiplexing. So, now, modulation has three advantages. First, enables frequency division multiplexing. Multiple users can talk with each other without interference by assigning each user to a certain frequency. Second, you avoid interference between multiple users and users will not be able to listen to each other. Each user will only listen to his intended receiver. Third, you can design a practical antennas because low frequencies require very long antennas. But higher frequencies, at higher frequencies, the antenna becomes smaller. So this is why we need modulation. In carrier communication, the signal modulates a sinusoidal carrier. The signal modifies the amplitude, frequency, or phase of a carrier. What do I mean by this? Let's explain it. Now, this is, this is your carrier, S of T. This is the signal that has the high frequency. Yes? And you have your message signal, M of T. Your message signal, M of T, can be transmitted by changing the amplitude or frequency or phase of the carrier signal. Now, the message signal, you cannot send it through the air directly. But what you can do is that you can, by using, by using the characteristics or the data bits of your message, you can use them to change the properties of the carrier that can travel over the air. So at the receiver, the receiver sees these carrier changes and map them to the data bits of the message. Give you example. Amplitude modulation. In amplitude modulation, basically, you let your message signal here change the amplitude of your carrier only. By changing the amplitude, you are conveying information. In frequency modulation, the message signal is used to change the frequency of the carrier to convey information. In phase modulation, the message signal is used to change the phase of the carrier only. So what, what do I mean by that? Let's take an example. Take an example here. Suppose your signal has this, this sequence of bits, yes? Eight bits, yes? And you want to transmit them. So this, you call it M of T. This is your message. And ca your carrier S of T, your carrier cosine. So this is cosine. This is your carrier, higher frequency. Can you transmit this over the air? Directly you cannot. But this you can transmit. But you want to send these. How do you do? You say, if zero comes, then make the amplitude low. If one comes, make the amplitude high. So when zero comes, what do you do? 
you send a signal, cosine signal with low amplitude. Another zero comes with low amplitude. Now one comes, when one comes, you change the amplitude like this. Zero comes, one comes, this signal goes to your receiver. Your receiver receives this. The receiver doesn't want this carrier signal. He wants the bits. So the receiver says, this is low, low amplitude. This means zero. Another low amplitude here means zero. Here high means one. Here low means zero, zero. And then he gets the signal back, the message bits. So now you understand how to do modulation. This is the easiest way to explain modulation to you. How to do it and how it works with the signals. But now along the way, you will learn many, many more modulation techniques and not only the amplitude with the frequency and phase and others. So is this clear? You like modulation now, you understand it? I think yes. The, the, what, the example I gave to you is digital modulation. We have what we call amplitude mod, uh, analog modulation. And the easiest analog modulation scheme is called double sideband amplitude modulation. You know what do you do when you are asked to modulate your signal using double sideband amplitude modulation? You just get your carrier and your message and multiply them with each other. This, this is your message and this is your carrier. Your message becomes the amplitude of your carrier. That's it. We usually set phase to zero to simplify mathematical discussion and to understand how this modulation works because in time domain it's very, very difficult to understand modulation. We go to the frequency domain. Assume this is your message signal, M of F. M of T, what's the Fourier transform? M of F. Now you multiply M of T by cosine 2 by FC, which is the carrier. After you multiply by FC, you will, you will cause shift to your original message signal. So basically, this baseband signal will be shifted to a higher frequency. One copy here, one copy here. Why? Because cosine is basically e to minus j, two by something, plus e to j. Yes, over two. So what do you, e to minus j, yes, takes your signal here, and the other one takes your signal here. A copy of it. And since it's divided by 2, the amplitude here will be divided by 2. So the amplitude here is smaller than 1. If, it is, if this is 2a, here it will be a. And causes the shift. Now what's the beauty of this? When you are at high frequency, you don't interfere with the other user. You have your own frequency. Yes? And you allow only this frequency to be transmitted. Only this band. This is double sideband amplitude modulation. Very easy, very straightforward. You have your carrier, multiply it by message, and the message will be shifted to high frequency bands in the frequency. And you get this. We call this the modulated signal. LSB called lower sideband, USB called upper sideband. Very easy, very straightforward. Mathematically, how do you do that? Or by, by diagrams, you have a of T, your signal. Your signal can be called the modulating signal, IMG, the modulating signal. And the output signal, modulated signal. The carrier is carrier, which is cosine omega C F. You multiply them with each other, you get the modulated signal, which is M of T, M of T multiplied by cosine omega CT. So basically, this is your M of T. Yes. This is your M of T in time domain. 
And after you multiply it by the cosine, since the cosine has higher frequency, the cosine, cosine is this frequency and the amplitude becomes, m of t becomes the amplitude, the envelope of that carrier. This is in time. See in time, you don't feel, you don't, you don't see it as kind of modulation, but in frequency, it's very clear. You have it in base band, after you modulate it, you shift it to higher bands. And this becomes modulated because you allow only this to be transmitted. You have higher frequency, which is suitable for uh, antenna design, and also higher frequency that's assigned to a certain user, where you can multiplex and share the channel with other users as well. So these are the two goals of modulation. Now, what's the relationship between signal bandwidth and carrier frequency? The, the carrier frequency should be much, much, much larger than the bandwidth of the signal. Why do we have this? To, av to avoid distortion from one perspective and also to make sure that we can multiplex different signals on the same line. For example, in AM radio, the bandwidth is of your signal is 5 kilohertz. The frequency, the carrier frequency is 550 to 1600 kilohertz. So as you can see, if you divide FC over B, what's the factor is around 100 or even more. What about FM? In FM, FC over B, 43, between 43 and 54. Television, FC over B is between 90 to 100. Now, do you need to memorize these things? No, you don't need. So why, sh why do we show you these things? To understand that FC in most of the practical system is much, much larger than the bandwidth. By a factor of how much? 100 to 43 to 9. So this is what I wanted to let you know about it. Now, you modulated your signal, you transmitted it over the air, now you want to demodulate it. How do, how do you perform demodulation for your signal? You get your X of T. X of T is the modulated signal. What's X of T? Everybody remembers with me what's X of T? It's M of T. Yes? multiplied by cosine 2 by FCT. What's this? This is the carrier. This is the signal. Multiply them with each other. You get the modulated signal, X of T. But the receiver received this. He wants only M of T. What does it do? Just multiply again by the carrier, cosine 2 by FCT. When you multiply by the carrier cosine again, cosine 2 by FCT, what do you get? You get square because this is similar to this. You get this value. Yes? Cosine square 2 by FC from math can be converted to this form, to summation. So the output will be half m of t multiplied by half cosine 4 by fct. What does this mean? This means that look at here, this is your modulated signal. When you demodulate, when you demodulate this, what do you get? What do you get? Let me show you here. You get this signal, you multiply it again by cosine, yes? Since you multiply it again by cosine and cosine e to minus j, e to my, plus j, what do you do? You shift again, left and right. By how much? By the, the value of fc. So you get another signal here, but with lower amplitude. With lower amplitude, like this. Because when you shift, you divide by 2. And you get another signal here on the origin. 
because fc plus fc minus fc so this becomes 2fc and this 0 and this what do you get when you multiply this by cosine you get another signal here and another signal here so this with this they add up to each other well what's the result the output is this and this small so at the receiver I'm interested in m of t this is modulated I don't want this I don't want this I only get this how do I do that by filter low pass filter so that I get only the signal around zero which is m of t my message now this is how we do it return back to the example to show you how it works you get this after demodulation now as you can see here this is what I just drew, drew to you yes this why do we have here higher the amplitude of the signal around zero higher than the one here because it's the summation of two and after that what do we get low pass filter we put low pass filter so that we get only this message the output the low pass filter does not have to be very sharp it can it can be smooth but it should be flat over the signal bandwidth clear I think it's very easy straightforward clear yes Do you have any questions so far? Do you know how to do to perform modulation, demodulation? I think you know. Now you are we can call you knowledgeable in how to perform analog amplitude modulation, double sideband, and demodulation. You can do it by math, by graphical representation in time domain, graphical representation in the frequency domain. And by words, you can explain it by words and say why do we need to perform this and what's the advantage of performing this. Clear? Double sideband single carrier example. Modulating a sinusoid is an important way to test the system. Let M of T, again this example by just giving numbers or real practical function. This can be a question in the exam, for example, or in the test. Give you, suppose M of T cosine 2 pi FMT, find the modulated signal, M of F, if the carrier frequency. Uh, this is M of, M of T, and I give you the carrier frequency and tell you, find the modulated signal in the frequency domain by functions, by math, and by drawing. And then, find the demodulated signal by math and by drawing. So what do, what do you do? M of T is cosine. What's M of F? Half delta F plus F M plus del half delta F minus F. Everybody knows this. What's the Fourier transform of cosine? Two deltas, one on positive, one on negative. Yes? Cosine, two deltas, one here, one here. How to, how to draw them? This. One here and one here. What's this? Fm. What's this? Minus Fm. This is the Fourier transform of cosine. Hey, this is how you write it in math. If this one, what's this? Half. Half. Good. Now modulate it. I will tell you the carrier is cosine 2 by Fc, not Fm. And Fc is much larger than Fm. What do you do? You multiply them with each other and you get these functions and you draw them even without knowing the functions you can quickly draw it this you shift it to to another to left and right so this becomes fc plus fm and the, and another one fc minus fm and this minus fc minus fm minus fc plus fm you get this this is, we call it the modulated signal. Double sideband modulated signal. Then I ask you, demodulate this. Yes? You have M of F. This is the Fourier transform of cosine. You have the modulated signal. The modulated signal after you multiply it by the carrier. And then I tell you, demodulate it and give me the signal. You did it, you, once you demodulate it, you get 
two signals, one around 2FC and one around zero. And here two signals, one around two, minus 2FC two and one around zero. The one around zero, since you have two signals on top of each other, the amplitude will become larger a little bit, yes? Since the amplitude is larger, the, your message signal will be amplified. Now, question, where is your message signal? Is it this or this or this? Around zero, this is your message signal. So, to get your message signal, what do you do? You put low pass filter, and this low pass filter around where? Around this. Once you put the low pass filter, you get this. This is in frequency domain. If I tell you, give me the function in time domain, inverse Fourier transform. This is two two pulses around in the means it's cosine again in time. I think it's easy, straightforward, and not difficult. This, if I ask you in frequency domain, what if I ask you in time domain? You tell me in time domain the m of t. I can draw m of t in time domain cosine. Cosine, everybody knows how to draw cosine. When you multiply it by cosine 2 by fc with the carrier, it becomes very fast. The carrier and the message is the envelope of the carrier. It, when you multiply it by the receiver by another carrier, even the frequency becomes faster. And after low pass filter, you get the cosine back. Basically, low pass filter gets the envelope of the high carrier frequency. So basically, you get this. Let me show you how to do that. You get this, the envelope. Yes? Not the higher frequency. The higher frequency, you filter it. You don't allow it to pass. And this is exactly equal to this. Clear? Easy modulation. Easy or difficult? I think easy, yes. But in the exam, you need to understand how to do it in time in frequency and by equations and why we use it, what's the importance of it. Types of modulators. So we can have a break here for five minutes and then return back and continue with the types of modulator. Thank you very much.